First of all, many thanks. I'll speak in English for our guests here. Many thanks to Simos Chomokos for getting so many distinguished friends in Delphi. Delphi is considered to be the center of the earth. And the reason it is considered to be the center of the earth is that in the ancient times, Zeus allowed two eagles from the two extremities of the world to cross around the world. And the two of them met over Delphi. And from that time, Delphi is considered to be the navel of the earth. I'll start uh, with what uh, President Bush had said. It's the economy stupid. Uh, the fact that we're not moving and growing fast enough, as Adriano mentioned earlier, is that the world is heavily over indebted. Global debt is about $280 trillion. It's not exactly measured, it's between 270 and 280. And global GDP is only $80 trillion. So there is a discrepancy of about three and a half to one. Now, what that means is that the world is not generating enough cash flow to be able to service that huge debt. And because the markets are over indebted, they cannot borrow to grow. This is the basic reason why today we're seeing such slow growth rates, even though central banks have brought down interest rates virtually to zero. Even if interest rates are virtually close to zero, you cannot lend money because I have to lend money to somebody who's already over indebted and he cannot repay back even at zero interest rates. And this is what we're seeing now. It's, we're in a, death, a debt trap. And this is causing a lot of stress. People not seeing enough growth grow worried and feel that globalization is not offering them what formerly globalization had promised them. This is why you see people like Donald Trump or Marie Le Pen or people in Austria or in, in uh, the Netherlands having the upper hand saying, OK, we need to become a little bit more nationalistic. We need to take care of ourselves first before we take care of the needs of the global community. Now, globalization has brought another thing, extreme concentration of wealth. I have a little uh, note here that in the year 2010, the 388 richest people in the world owned 50% of global wealth. All the money that the 7.7 .7 billion inhabitants of this earth owed, 50% of that was owned, owned by 388 people. That concentration narrowed further in 2011 with 177 people owning half of the world's wealth. In 2012, instead of 177, we went down to 159. Let's call them individuals or families. In 2013, only 92 people owned half of the world's wealth. In 2014, 80. In 2015, 62 people owned half of the world's debt. And in 2016, about 48. So there's a tremendous concentration of wealth. And that cr creates by itself a lot of stress. And the, the stress is exhibited uh, sometimes in terrorism, sometimes in people voting for extreme parties that talk well and think that there's some way out of that. The second major trend is that the center of gravity is moving from the west to the east. And when I say east, we're talking about India, China, Australia, Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia, which is growing very fast and is going to be a major power very, very shortly. East has a number of advantages, one of which is the following. Their spending is much less for social security than what it is in the Western countries, something that Adriano alluded to earlier. So in Greece, for example, we have about 60 billion euros of tax revenues. Of the 60 billion, 18 goes just to subsidize the social security system. That's about six times more, 600% more, than what the average Eastern Asia country is paying. So when there is so much need for social security payments, there is not much money left to spend on growth, on research, on development, or lower taxes, and what have you. And this is the reason, I think, the trend will continue in favor of 
Asian countries versus Western countries, in addition to the fact that the demographics there are much more favorable than the demographics in the Western world. Now, the Western world has a couple of advantages, much more stability in terms of politics. The democracies have been functioning for many, many years now. The better university system. And the third, I would say, in something that's very much neglected, they have much more advanced justice systems. If you go and have a problem in China and you're a foreigner, you're not exactly sure whether you will really get the justice you deserve. But if you're in Switzerland or Germany or the UK or the United States, you have a feeling that the justice systems there are much more advanced and are not favoring anybody because of political or national or other regions. The third major shift is the shift from basic industry to high technology. Those who command high technology are going to be the ones that are leaders. When I was young, it was General Motors and General Electric and DuPont. These were the big, big companies one would love to work with, or a bank. Today, it's Apple, it's Microsoft, it's Amazon or eBay, and these uh, companies such as Google. And those, even if you look at the stock market prices, they have tremendously exploded versus the old run-of-the-mill industrial companies. So those in the future who will command high technology and will be able to advance high technology like some Chinese and Korean companies are doing now, they will claim the biggest share of the value added. Everybody will be able to live and every, there will be enough for everybody. But those who will actually make the best of it are those who will command these high technologies. Regarding Europe and Euroscepticism, I think Euroscepticism is healthy. Europe has come too fast, too much, and people are reacting. They don't know who's making the decisions and why they're making the decisions. Most people feel there's a huge bureaucracy in Brussels getting extremely well paid where everybody else in Europe is suffering, and the best thing they can aspire to is to become a bureaucrat in Brussels. I think Europe will stay. Even 2017, even if we have some upsets in some elections, there won't be a threat to Europe. It's here to stay, but it needs to reconsider some of the things and how fast it has been moving. It has been moving very fast, and people cannot take such speed. But overall, it has been an excellent experiment. I think it has been very, very favorable to the average European. It just needs to sit down and correct its mistakes before it moves to the more federalist uh, level. So basically, I'm very optimistic. I think there are tough problems ahead, but there is enough human brain around to be able to solve these problems. And even though we will face another two, three, four years of tough times, um, the future will, in the end, look much, much brighter. Thank you, Pinelopi.